You know, one of the, the privileges um, that I feel like I have, um, and it, it's really it's really humbling at the end of the day, but it's also very exciting for me, is to know some of your stories. Uh, I just love the, the privilege of entering in to some areas that, that maybe might be really difficult or maybe even embarrassing for some. And for others to be invited into really joyful moments or maybe moments of fear. And I've just seen what a great privilege it is to pastor you. Um, And I want to thank you. I probably don't share that thankfulness often, uh, but I find it a great privilege uh, to walk with you and to share Jesus and to share the scriptures. All right, we are... Uh, roping back in here um, to uh, our passage this morning. So here's a, a question for you. What is, and you don't need to tell me because it might get a little crazy, uh, what's the last dream that you had? Yeah, and all of a sudden it's like, oh no. I'm also not going to share my last dream with you because it'd probably freak you all out. But uh, at our outreach retreat uh, this weekend, uh, we had several of our uh, people, Jackie and Judy and Richard um, and many others, put together just a, an amazing, essentially 24 hours uh, of searching God out. Where are we going with our outreach? God, what are you doing through us? And it was a great privilege uh, to be there. And one of the conversations we had around one of the table had something to do with dreams. And it was just crazy. You know, some of the stuff coming out speak life that's our theme for a couple weeks this mo this uh season and uh i don't know about you but i find myself in desperate need at times of life being spoken into me have you ever been in that place where you're just longing and if i'm honest with you that's where jackie was this morning Needing life being spoken in, a family to love and to send. And all of us find ourselves in that position at times. That we need someone to speak life and to remind us to look up that God is for us, that He's not against us. That life matters, that you have significance, all sorts of areas of need that we have. But the flip side of that is pretty awesome too that others around you are in need of you to be that life speaker in their lives. I could share story after story of opportunities that that I've just had the privilege of watching life literally being spoken into someone. A lot of those stories involve you as you've blessed others. But above it all, or maybe beneath it all, supporting it all, is this... Radical idea. I really think God delights in speaking life to you. I think God finds great satisfaction when His words are given to you and you find life and hope and you're lifted out of despair and out of darkness and out of addictions. I think God actually delights and enjoys those moments. So last week, we took a look uh, a little uh, earlier in Genesis, about the whole idea that, that God breathed life into His creation to man and woman, that He's a life-giving God, that He sustains life, and He enjoys doing it. This week, we get the privilege of looking at God promising life, that God is going to promise life. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 15. We're going to meet a man named Abram, which is Abraham, before God changes his name, just a a few short chapters after uh, Genesis 15. We'll be just in the first six verses, Genesis 15, 1 to 6. Abram is going to receive a vision, a vision. And I want to clarify a little bit before we get into the text, the whole notion of dreams Versus promises. Okay? Every so often, as I'm reading an article, um, 
especially in, in the bioethics. Uh, I don't know if any of you are attracted to some of the ethical dilemmas in uh, the medical field, but it's fascinating. Some of the, the new things that uh, men and women have to struggle with, and does it matter, and should we go here, and is there even a should overarching this whole thing, and how do we know, and what steps should, should I take? And um, one of the, the latest ones was that Devices that can kind of translate some of the synapses firing in our brain. And people can essentially read what you're thinking. And I was reading through that, and one part of me thinks, come on, you know, really. I'm skeptical of that. Another part of me is like, that's super scary. But it led me then to, to this idea. What if someone could plug into your dreams and project them up front? Right? Alright, so maybe there's three reactions to that. One is that would be awesome. You know, I don't think there's anything more creative, more wildly exciting than when people are like, I don't know what that was all about when the purple frog like jumped into the middle of the crowd at the wedding. Uh Some of it would be super fun to watch. Some of it would be super scary. You know those dreams that you wake up in a cold sweat or maybe you wake up angry because of something that just happened, or or maybe it'd be really, really embarrassing uh, for some of us as some dreams would be revealed. A dream, one way to look at it is simply something our brain has collected and some synapses are firing some images our way. And we try to create some order in our sleep and it comes out really strange, but it's simply some biology happening in there. Okay. Another way to look at the word dream, a dream might be something you really want. Something you're passionate for. We would say that's a dream, right? I share uh, my friend Bruce's dream that someday this winter we will get piles and piles of snow. At this point, that for me is simply a strong, passionate desire that I just really want to see. But some of you share a much different dream. Oh, God, please just give me a 63 degree day. This is killing me. A a little sunshine, a little warmth will help me just get through this winter. Both of them might be dreams. Some of those also get really serious. Some of you are dreaming of retiring early. If I can just make the figures work out, I'm tired of slugging it out eight to five. I've done it for 30 years, 40 years. I'm ready to retire it. And you're dreaming of retiring early. Or maybe for some of you, you're dreaming of finding a spouse or as you take that step into college. A piece of you is like, oh, I really hope, I really want to meet someone that I can share life with. And maybe some of you this morning, you really want, you long for a spouse to know Jesus and to follow Him for the first time. Or maybe your dream is for an aging parent, an aging parent to get well enough to return from the hospital one last time. Or maybe... Some of you are dreaming, longing for the fractured relationship with that very same parent to be healed and reconciliation for the first time in decades to happen. And you pray for it and you yearn for it. And for some of you, you would trade almost anything for some of those dreams, wouldn't you? And I want to tread, not carefully this morning, but I want to tread clearly on this, because we're going to read about God promising offspring to someone. And some of you have longed for and dreamt for this very thing to no avail. For some of you, it's been a long standing dream that God would give you offspring. And nothing has come about. Others here this morning have experienced miscarriages and tragedies and you've carried the pain for years. Maybe for some of you it's even been decades. And I want to 
Pastor you well this morning as we head into our text. And not just throw out false cliches and tell you, hold on to your dreams. Just hold on to your dreams. God will come through because I'm not sure that that will be the case. Which gets to the point. There's a difference between dreams and promises. Okay? There's a difference between dreams and promises. It can be good advice for for someone to tell you, well, don't give up on your dreams. I'm all for that. But it's another thing pastorally to take Scripture and try to overlay something and say, and therefore God will do it. Unless He's promised, I don't know. I don't know if He will. And too many commentators take this passage that we're going to be in and conclude this. Dream big and wait for God to come through. At least three different guys that I read, that was their conclusion. Hold on to your dreams. Don't give up and wait for God to come through. And I'm a little skeptical that that would be good pastoral advice for you. So, here we go. Genesis 15, 1 to 6. One more thing. Before, we need to address it, this underlying question that we don't want to ask. And it's not real comfortable to ask. Okay? And it's this. Is my dream, is my passionate desire, is it something that's from God? Or is it something that's simply from me? And it's a troubling question because for some of us, I think some of those dreams, we've translated that they're promises, and we've even got to the point of saying, and God, I'm so angry that you haven't come through. And I imagine God is responding, I never promised that to you, child, son, daughter. And we have to at least ask that underlying question is, some of the, the dreams, the, the desires we have, are they potentially not promised from God? Abram, he's a guy who doesn't need a dream. He needs a word from the Lord. He's in chapter 15, about 90-something, mid-90s, all right? Uh, I was going to ask uh, like who our oldest person is this morning, but we're, we're not going to go there. 90, uh, I've got a grandmother I speak about her often. She's 101 and a half, so she's moving up to 102. And uh, that's just awesome. Um, we saw a video at our retreat of a woman. I think she was 102, right? She just turned 102. She started teaching at 80 years old. <laughs> Imagine that if you're like around 80 to be like, I know, I'm going to go teach. And she's 102, and the kids are loving on her. Abraham is up in that age range of, all right, like, that's pretty old. Abraham is 90-something years old, and he received a word from the Lord when he was in his 70s, so he's not a spring chicken when God first approaches him and says, you're going to be a great nation. And in order for Abraham to be a great nation... That means he's got to have some kids. That's how nations were kind of formed back then. I have lots of kids, and those lots of kids have lots of kids. And then my great-great-grandkids, they're innumerable. Abraham is 75-ish when he receives that first promise from God. You're going to have kids. And now he's in his late 90s. And he's a man in need of a promise because nothing has happened. Still got no kid. And he's navigating through life and it's not going as expected. Abram has left the land of his family. In Genesis 12, he's promised to become a great nation. So he leaves again. There's famine. There's a threat from the Pharaoh. He's kind of trading his wife to try to get out of there. Genesis 13 his nephew, Lot, and Abram separate. 
and they're looking at the land and there's kind of a dispute. Where am I going to go? Where are you going to go? Well, I want to go here. And Abram works out the dispute of the land. And he receives another promise that his offspring is going to be like dust. And then in Genesis 14, there's a war. And Abram steps right into the middle of the war with these nine kings. He steps into the middle of it to go rescue Lot because Lot had been taken. There's victory, but there's a lot of risk. And then there's this this priest king called Melchizedek that shows up and seems to kind of prefigure Jesus. And a lot has just happened to Abram, but nothing has happened in terms of offspring. Okay, Genesis 15. After this, that's a whole lot of this. All right. That's a whole lot of this. After this, like, after those events, that's some big stuff that Abram just went through. And if you look back on your week, what kind of this is have happened? Look back on the past month. Can you remember the past year? What kind of major events have happened in life? Can you press that back over the past few decades? Because sitting in this room right now are a whole lot of thises that you're living after this. Whatever those might be, those experiences. Lots of, has happened, right? Children have gotten sick. They've graduated from high school. Maybe new babies have come in. Maybe some jobs have been lost. Or maybe promotions have been given. Parents have been moving. Perhaps loved ones have been dying. Ministries have been born. Hobbies have been given up. And others have been taken. Your marriages have been at scary moments. You've had delightful moments within them. This room is packed with a whole lot of this is. Alright? And this morning, I think it's appropriate for that beginning phrase to be ours too, after this, after a whole lot of life has happened, Abram was a 90-something-year-old man holding on to a promise. And at this point, I think he's wondering if it's just a dream. And he's a man standing in desperate need of a life-giving word from the Lord, a promise. And I think some of us might be in that very same position after this. You're a woman in desperate need of a promise, a life-giving, spoken promise from the Lord. Not just a dream. Not just another charlatan coming your way. Another counselor, another psychologist, another medication, another... It's not that you need. You need the life-giving word of a promise from God because you've been through a whole lot of this. And you're wondering now. And God gives him his word. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And I love how he begins. Those are some fantastic words right there. Do not be afraid. So if you were a commentator, um, we call it exegesis. It's kind of the, the fancy word we use when we're breaking down scripture and working it out. If you're one of those guys, or maybe if your task was to put together a sermon to share with people, and you see those words, do not be afraid, spoken to Abram, what would you say Abram might be afraid of, that he needs those words? He doesn't seem to be afraid of the war he just fought. He was pretty amazing, actually. He took like 300 guys and just wrecked everybody. I don't think he's afraid of war. He's not afraid of famine. He's dealt with that. He's no longer afraid of Pharaoh. Pharaoh basically is afraid of Abram at this point. What possibly could Abram be afraid of that God would begin, do not be afraid? Here it is, and it's the same fear as yours. That God might not deliver on his promise. Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever been in that position where Maybe you read a passage and it's this overarching promise that you begin clinging on to and after a year, after a month, after five years, you're like, I don't really know if God is going to come through. 
I don't know if his promises can be relied on. I think Abram is afraid specifically of God's promise that he would have a heritage, a son, a lineage, a legacy behind him. And what fear does every single time, fear gives rise to doubts. And doubts give rise to rebellion. And rebellion gives rise to abandoning the promise. Fear will give rise to doubts. I'm afraid God might not come through. And maybe He's not. Doubts will always give rise to mistrust. Therefore, I don't know if I can trust God. And the final step, that mistrust will give way to outright rebellion. Therefore, I shall do it my way. If I can't trust God, then I will figure this out. And we've all been down that road, haven't we? So, for young people who aren't married, you can see this road. Fear, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to meet the right person. Gives way, that doubt will give way, <clears throat> or fear will give way to doubt. And I don't know if God really even has my best interest in mind. And doubt will give way to mistrust. I don't know if God's way of dating really is appropriate. And waiting for sex before marriage, that sure sounds pretty archaic and that sure sounds old-fashioned. And I don't know if that's the best way to me. Gives way to, hey, you want to share some expenses? Live together? That'd be a whole lot easier, wouldn't it? And we'd get to know each other before we got married, right? You can just see the pattern. And I'm just picking on that, but in all of our lives, we have that same pattern. That fear gives way to doubt, doubt gives way to mistrust, and mistrust gives way to rebellion. And God reassures His man with words that He needs. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. And Abraham gives voice, words, to this alternate plan that he has. Verse 2, but Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I still remain childless? I was like 70-something and it was crazy to believe you, God. I was old then. Now I'm 90-something. I have no kid. You haven't done a thing. And because you haven't done a thing, God, here's my plan. The one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you've given me no children. And so a measly little servant in my household is going to be my heir. Because if I can't trust God's word, then I'll come up with plan B. And plan B... If you've ever had a plan B, plan B is never robust. Plan B is never joyful. And plan B never quite has the ending that you have in mind. Plan B is essentially seeking an alternate means of satisfying the need that God has promised to fulfill. God promises to fulfill a need. You don't think God is coming through. So you come up with plan B to fulfill that need that God promised and He hasn't come through. And plan B always has some level of disaster and pain at the end of it. But you know what else plan B has? Doesn't that sound reasonable? Alright, so now you're 90-something, Abram. You have no kid. So, maybe the reasonable thing when you go to your estate lawyer to draft your will would be well, I've got the servant. He's pretty good. So let's, let's go ahead and build around him because I've got no kid. And plan B sure seems reasonable. And many of our plan Bs seem absolutely reasonable in our mind. And they probably look good to others. It doesn't seem outrageous to me. He has no kids. He's old. Of course. 
He's got a plan for something. Abram's plan B doesn't seem outrageous, and neither do yours. Neither do yours. It rarely ever sounds outrageous to fill the need that God doesn't seem to be filling. There's not a whole lot of alarms that go off like, that's nuts, that's crazy. Probably actually what goes off is, of course, that makes good sense. But they don't account for a very important truth. And here it is this morning. God always fulfills His promises. Whatever promise you want to take, here's the word. God always fulfills His promises. And faith is the mechanism that they're received and counted as righteousness. And God interacts back with Abram in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. You ever done that? You ever stood outside and just been blown away? I think I've shared the story, but several years ago, uh, we were up at Lafayette uh, Campground, and pitch black up there. I mean, there's nothing going on. And so our entertainment while we camp is to look at stars. And I'm a guy who, there's one class I dropped in college. It was astronomy. There's something about it. I was like, I can't do this. Uh, so I'm not a star guy. But I can be blown away by like the general things about the sky. And so we're out there. We had made popcorn over uh, the stove, the Jiffy Pop thing. We, we bring it out to the super dark field. And we're laying down in the field, staring up at the stars. And uh, we're just kind of wondering, oh, can you imagine being so familiar with the stars that you know when something is different, when something's out of place, like the wise men being like, there it is. That's the star. And we're having this whole conversation that's totally ill-informed because none of us know about astronomy. And we're walking back after enjoying that. And uh, we meet this guy. And this guy's like either an astronomer, which would be weird because we're camping in the middle of nowhere, or he's just this passionate guy that has all sorts of hobbies about stars. Well, he brings his binocular and his laser pointer, Okay. He says, if you guys want to spend a few more minutes, I'll I'll show you some stuff. We're like, yeah. So he's pointing out all sorts of stuff. And then he gives one of us the binoculars. And he points with his laser pointer as if he's touching a star. Because it kind of looks like that. Yes, he does say, I can't leave this on for long. There may be some airplanes flying by. So don't worry about that. It it was fine. He's pointing up. And uh, he says, all right, can you find that spot right there? And uh, I think Ethan had the binoculars. So one of us did. And we're looking up, yeah, I see, he's like, do you see that gap in the Milky Way? We're like, oh yeah, yeah, it's right there. It's like, on the other side of that is another galaxy. And there's a moment for us of, what? And God does the same kind of thing for Abraham. Look up, your need of a life-giving promise for me? How about this? You're not just going to have a son. You're going to have so many that you won't even be able to count them. Your offspring is going to be greater than the stars in the heaven. And Abram does this amazing, crazy thing. He accepts the word of the Lord as reliable and true. He believes what God promises to him at this moment. And then God does this gracious thing. Abram believed the Lord... And he credited it, credited it to him as righteousness. Abram accepts the word of the Lord as reliable and true. He believes. And then he acts in accordance with it, which is righteousness. And God, therefore, accepts Abram into his promises. Because holding on to the promises of God will always require you to hold on to the promises of God through difficulties. 
I mean, think of some of the promises that you know in the Bible. Did Noah have to face some difficulties holding to the promise of God that building this ark was a really good idea to save his life and the life of his family? Yeah, I mean, all all the people around him were ridiculing him. It had never rained before, Noah. I don't know if you know that, but Scripture says it had never dropped a drop of rain, and here's this dude building a boat. Noah had to hold on to the promises of God through major difficulty, never mind the storm itself and the flood. Abraham and the child. Abraham's story continues rolling. He holds on to the promises of God through some really, really challenging things. Moses shows up to Pharaoh, the most powerful king, and he says, uh, let my people go. And Moses takes this position of holding on to the promises of God through incredibly challenging, difficult circumstances. Because that's how it goes. God promises, but there will be incredible difficulties through which faith will carry you. Not faith in good outcomes, not faith in your dreams, not faith in the things you really want, but faith in the God who fulfills His promises. Abraham needed this vision, a word from the Lord to reaffirm the Lord's promise. And you and I have this amazing gift that Abraham didn't have. Right here. Abraham didn't have the ability to go into his Bible, because there was none, and look up, oh God, I need a promise. I've been reading in James, or I've been reading in the book of Psalms. God, I need to share your promises. And and all of a sudden coming across a passage that's amazingly relevant as God shares his promise. Abraham didn't have that. And so what did he need? He needed the voice of the Lord in a vision sharing his promise. But you and I, we get this awesome privilege of having God's word spoken in the scriptures to us. And there are times that we need the life-giving words of someone who loves Jesus and is willing to speak God's promises into our lives. Not just dropping like verse bombs around us, but speaking words of life into moments of doubt, moments of wondering. Because I don't want to be a wet blanket here, but not all your dreams are going to come to pass. I said it. Not everything you passionately desire is going to happen. As much as you may passionately desire them. But not, or I should say, but everything that the Lord promises will. And sometimes, don't you find that you need someone to like share that with you and speak that promise into your life and open up God's Word and be like, I think I have something that God wants to give to you. Here it is. I just brought out three examples. There's hundreds. Here are just three examples. Just listen to them and see if you can picture a moment in your life or a moment in the life of someone you care around you receiving this kind of promise that matters. Here's Psalm 34, 17 to 18. The righteous cry out, And the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their trouble. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Life-giving words. Life-giving promises to someone who's crushed in spirit and can't see the hope ahead to share God's promise with them. Here's another one that someone shared with me years ago now. Joshua 1.9 Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I needed those words. And God gave the grace of someone in my life speaking that promise to me. Or maybe this one. John chapter 8. 34 to 36. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. 
So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed, brother. You are free indeed, sister. These are three out of hundreds of examples of places we can bring God's promises to share and to speak life into someone else's life. And I can't help but think that our Father takes great pleasure in using us to bring His promises to light in others' lives. I want to encourage you this morning, not from guilt. I I really try not to do guilt. I really, really make an effort. Not out of guilt. But I want to encourage you to be in the Word. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Read through it. Listen to it. And if you're not in God's Word at all, take a little baby step and just choose one verse to spend some time with this week. That would be awesome. Baby steps are awesome steps. For others of us, maybe it's something a little more significant that requires a little more work. I want to encourage you, you've got to be in God's Word if you're going to speak God's promises to other people. The other piece of it is that you need to be in others' lives. Ready to speak promises of life. And God gives us these promises, not because He has to, but I think He really loves you. I think God is in love with you. Which is amazing. But I think He gives us these promises literally because He loves you. And He wants life to explode inside of you. And what God has promised, God will do. Believing that and living that is what we call faith. Alright? And faith can look insane. Faith can look crazy. Like plan B might look reasonable. Plan A, believing God's promises at times, looks nuts. And yet, at the end of it all, living in God's promises, believing God's promises, there is life that perhaps you've never known. That God forgives because He's righteous and just. And maybe there's a weight that needs to be taken off of you as you come to Jesus and experience His forgiveness. Or or maybe for some of you, it's you're in such a dark place and you don't see hope. And it's God's promise over you that will allow you to cling to that, not your wild dreams, but God's promises that's going to place you on safe, healthy, free ground. Maybe for the first time in decades. You see, believing God sometimes looks crazy, but it is the sanest decision you can make if you're interested in your own life and joy and peace and happiness. I want to encourage you. Spend a little time in your Bible this week. Open it. Do something with it. And allow God to speak His promises of life to you. And maybe even... Open your life up to speak that to someone else. Let me uh, invite our worship (coughs) team up as we close. (coughs) God, I thank you for your promise of life over Abraham. That one of those stars that he would have seen in the sky would have represented his best offspring ever that Jesus would come through His line. And that Your blessing would pour out to the nations through Abraham, but it would pour out to the entire world through Jesus. And God, I pray for my friends, my brothers, my sisters, maybe some folks I don't know this morning. Oh God, would You speak Your promises of life into their life to lift them up from the places that they find themselves. God, would you open us up to be that voice of speaking life into one another. God, would you give us a courage to have faith? Would you increase our faith? Because we can be of such little faith. God, would you increase our faith to be able to hold recklessly and wildly onto your promises until one day they fully bring the life that you've promised. The Lord, may you have your way among us. We're grateful to be your family. In Jesus' name, amen.